uh, Kwang Yu. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah. is um, uh, Dong Shang uh, uh, on? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Welcome. Hi. So let's let's proceed and uh, thank you to all. Uh, this is the first event um, of the Tocqueville Series and Political Theory Program. We'll have quite a few this semester online. Thank you to those from outside of Bloomington for joining us. Kwang Yu will be the moderator and he will make the presentations. We'll, we'll end promptly at three, at no later than 3 p.m. So we need to be very, very prompt. Yeah, of course, if you have to log out at any time, we are you know, free to do so. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. So hello, everyone. So uh, it's good to see so many people come, 20. Yeah, many familiar faces and many new to me. So uh, thank you for showing up and I look forward to seeing everyone's participation in this discussion. So um, uh, my name is Kuang Yu Zhao. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Political Science here. So before Kim and the other panelists speak, I will do some brief introduction and uh, how speak, housekeeping. So um, the Presentation speaker is Minyu Kim. Kim is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at IU. His research interest is focused on the intellectual history of liberalism in post-war Japan. So today he's going to present his paper titled Reconceptualizing Liberty in the Time of Disorder, Mariyama Masao's Request for Responsible Liberty in Post-War Japan. Yeah, um, this paper draft uh, as shared uh, is developed from a part of his dissertation project, as, as far as I know. So first, thanks to Kim for sharing the work with us and making this event happen. And uh, I hope today's exchanges could be helpful to you. So today we are also honored to have two other uh, panelists, Dr. Hossein Banai and Dr. Dongxian Jiang, join us uh, as discussants on Kim's paper. Dr. Banai is a Assistant Professor of International Studies at IU. Uh, Professor Banai's research is focused on Iran's political development as well as on US-Iran relations. Uh, receiving his PhD from, uh, in political science from Brown University, Professor Banai is also a very uh, frequent cordial friend in our political theory community here. So uh, welcome. And uh, Dr. Dongxian Jiang is currently a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Political Science at Stanford University. Uh, he received his PhD from the Department of Politics at Princeton University. His interests include studying the pressing practical questions of democratic life across cultural divides, both domestically and globally. So we wanted to have Dr. Banai and Dr. Jiang join the discussion on Kim's work because I know their respective works both address the relevant topic of the theory of liberalism in the non-Western context. Uh, Dr. Zhang just finished his dissertation on contemporary Chinese political theory, I think largely constructed from a liberal perspective. perspective. And uh, according to my personal knowledge, exciting news from Professor Banai is that his new book, Hidden Liberalism, Burden Region, Burden Regions of Progress in Modern Iran, uh, it's coming out soon, maybe in two or three months from uh, Cambridge University Press. So many thanks to both of you for serving us the discussion today. So we are excited to listen to your comments and thoughts on the relevant topics. So yeah, this is uh, the first meeting of the Tokyo Lecture Series in, the, in this four semester. So we have a couple of income events. So thank you. And also thank you to uh, Professor Aurelian Kuryutu for supporting this event by including it in the Tokyo lecture series. So, and uh, also I want to thank uh, many faculty members and graduate students in the Department of Political Science who, who offered important support for this event. And thanks to the staff at the Austrian workshop for providing the logistical and the technological support. So our plan is that we will have the discussion for like 75, 90 minutes. We will start by Kim's presentation for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, followed by Dr. Dongxian Zhang's comments and later Dr. Banai's comments. So ideally 10 minutes each, then we will open the Q&A section or actually like just open the uh, discussion. So now welcome Kim. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Uh, thank you for coming here for a wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm Min Hyuk Kim, and today I will be presenting my paper titled Deconceptualizing Liberty in Time of Disorder. This is the second chapter of my dissertation, and I should say that it is my great honor to present my paper in Tocqueville Lecture, and I hope you could enjoy my presentation. Any comments would be great, greatly appreciated. So. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, before we jump into the main topic, please take a look at these pictures. These pictures are taken from various countries such as the United States, Canada, and UK. And as you can see, uh, they are about anti-mask wearing movements that took place since the outbreak of corona pandemic. After seeing these pictures, uh, I became curious uh, if a similar kind of protest has ever taken place in East Asian countries, such as South Korea, Japan, or Taiwan. Thus, I conducted a brief research on it, but I couldn't find uh, any case. So I was very puzzled by the following question. Why there is no anti-mask protest in those East Asian countries, even when freedom of speech is relatively well protected? Actually, there have been some explanations on this. For instance, some commentators argued that uh, it is a matter of culture. They say that there has been mask wearing culture in East Asia due to their pre pre previous experiences of the spread of virus, even before the outbreak of COVID-19. Well, I don't reject this explanation entirely, but I believe that culture is too broad term to explain this phenomenon. To my knowledge, it is almost the same that most Asian people, like Westerners, dislike wearing a mask on a daily basis because it's very uncomfortable. But most of them are more likely to follow the public safety rules because uh, that's what they have to do to protect themselves and protect each other. Perhaps today's my presentation could give you a better answer to this question. I will show that the notion of liberty in East Asia, specifically in post-war post -war Japan, has been developed in a close relationship with the notion of responsibility. This notion emphasizes that individual liberty should be exercised responsibly. A systematic version of this idea was developed by Japanese post-war thinker, Maruyama Masao, the main thinker of my study. So I'm going to introduce his theory of liberty from now. This is the picture of Maruyama. He is the most important political thinker of the previous century in Japan. He lived in the time of constant change and disorder. During his teens and twenties, he observed the rise of fascism in Japan society. And during the last years of the Pacific War, he was conscripted to the Japanese army as a private surgeon. Although he was a junior faculty professor of Tokyo University at the time. After Japan surrendered to the Allied powers in 1945, Mariana returned to the university and embarked on the project of analyzing the root causes of the rise of fascism and militaristic nationalism in early modern Japan. He was particularly upset by the irresponsible mindset of wartime Japanese leaders. And he was also very critical of the notion of liberty that prevailed in the pre-war Japanese society. In which liberty was rightly understood as doing whatever he or she wants to do without restriction. He argued that 
this kind of hedonistic understanding of liberty, which he termed sensual liberty, also paved the way for the rise of fascism in pre-war Japan. Mariyama's key message on liberty is very simple and clear. Individuals can be genuinely free only when they exercise their freedom independently and responsibly. He thought that liberty could exist only when people fight for it, actively struggle for it. Liberty is not something that is freely given from the government. Mariyama is especially concerned that if people exercise their freedom without proper understanding of political and social basis of modern liberty, individuals would not be able to protect it on their own. He believed that the extent to which individuals could exercise liberty was closely linked to the surrounding social conditions, such as national independence, liberal political culture, and active citizenship. I think that it might be useful to in, uh, explain the concrete Mariama's idea of responsive liberty in comparison with Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty, which might be much more familiar to us. First, Mariama defines uh, Berlin, Isaiah Berlin defines negative liberty primarily as absence of constraint. An individual is free as long as he or she can act as one wishes without external distinction. Uh, in this tradition of negative liberty, the protection of individuals from intrusive interference is considered very important because otherwise individuals cannot develop their own moral character or, or natural faculty. Furthermore, liberal thinkers like John Stuart Mill believe that society as a whole could get benefit from a diverse character and culture when there is less and less restriction on individual liberty. Thus, uh, this view is based on an optimistic view on liberal individualism. However, uh, Maru Maruyama was very critical of this idea, particularly he was pessimistic of the notion of notion, the, this notion's applicability to Japanese society. Maruyama worried that the understanding of liberty as merely absence of constraint would result in great social disorder in the context of Japan, given the legacy of hierarchical and collectivist social culture. In short, he feared that negative notion of liberty would result in a political and passive understanding of liberty. Uh, next, uh, let's compare his notion of liberty and Isaiah Berlin's notion of positive liberty. Mariama's notion of liberty, responsible liberty, appears to be much more similar to the positive notion of liberty as defined by Isaiah Berlin, in a sense that he Mariama defines liberty, genuine, genuine liberty as a rational and autonomous self-determination. Berlin similarly defines positive liberty as self-realization or self-determination. However, there is a crucial difference, difference in their divergent understanding of how individuals could realize themselves. In my reading of Isaiah Berlin, his positive liberty primarily focuses on a cognitive aspect of self-realization. For instance, from Berlin's perspective, I think, I am my own master when I have perfect knowledge of myself, I'm, when I'm perfectly reasonable. It is important to note that this notion of true ideal self is connected to the danger of paternalism that Isaiah Berlin feared. He thought that the notion, the notion of true ideal self had resulted in many totalitarian ideologies throughout the modern history when it was combined with some sort of super personal entity such as a state, nation, and a class. 
On the other hand, Mariama thought that having perfect knowledge of myself was neither needed or nor possible. We will never know the ultimate and universal superior value because uncertainty and plurality of values are the key nature of our political life. Mariam argued that what is crucial was making one's own decision prudently and then willingly take the responsibility for the consequences of our behavior. Only this way, a person could be genuine master of oneself. This is the idea of responsible liberty proposed by Maruyama. Let me conclude my presentation with some thoughts on how Maruyama's political thinking could expand our understanding of liberty. The first lesson, historical or national context play a crucial role in shaping specific understanding of liberty. Mariama's notion of liberty uh, was developed from his critical reflection on the inappropriate understanding of liberty that prevailed in prior Japan. The second lesson, responsible agency could be understood as a new basis for liberty as self-realization. I believe that this volitional notion of volitional approach could be a good answer to, a pro to the problem of paternalism that Isaiah Berlin feared. The third lesson, the notion of liberty is a politically contested idea. Therefore, you should re we should repeatedly ask how and under what conditions liberty could contribute to improve our life, both at the individual level and at the social level. To conclude, I'd like to highlight that it is important to know the contextual and plural nature of meaning, the meaning of the liberty. This understanding is especially important, I think, when the idea and the value of liberty is seriously contested and challenged, like the situation we are observing today. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you to uh, Miu Yu. Uh, next, we will, we will have uh, Dr. Dong Xian Zhang's comments. So please. Okay. So uh, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Kim, for this very interesting paper and the presentation. And uh, thank you, Kuang Yu and Aurelian, for uh, giving me this chance to comment on and respond to Kim's paper. So in my presentation, I uh, want to raise, I want to first uh, raise a very broad question, which is also a comment on Kim's presentation of Maruyama myself, and then offer some suggestions for uh, how to improve this paper even further. And uh, I also want to introduce that to my friend and co-author Sean O'Dwyer at Kushu University is also attending this event from Japan. He is an expert of early 20th century Japanese intellectual history he may also contribute something very valuable in the roundtable discussion later. So um, the biggest question I uh, want to ask after reading this paper is regarding the term uh, liberalism. So in this paper, Kim characterizes Mariyama as a champion of uh, post-war Japanese liberalism and argues that uh, Mariyama consciously participated in conversations with pre-war liberal liberals in Japan. So Kim thinks that Mariyama is and should be regarded as a liberal, though he offers a reconceptualization of personal freedom uh, that incorporates more uh, emphasis on citizens' social responsibility. Kim's paper is also, uh, also gives us an impression that some pre-war Japanese thinkers were also liberals, primarily because they promoted the expansion of personal freedom against external constraints. My question, which is actually a, a clarificatory one for, for Kim, is that by which standard should we regard Mariyama as a liberal? And in what sense can we treat his pre-war predecessors as liberals as well? So I'm asking this question out of my ignorance of Japanese intellectual history. So Mariyama may have publicly identified himself as a liberal 
or his contemporaries may have recognized him as a liberal. So his pre-war predecessors may also have identified themselves as liberals. But their actual political thought makes me doubt their liberal credentials. So although we should avoid essentializing liberalism by prescribing the essential doctrines of liberalism, it is undeniable that there are some core concerns that liberals in the past few centuries have constantly addressed. According to Judith Clark, for example, liberalism is first and foremost about drawing the boundary between individual citizens and the state power. Civil and political rights are meant to protect the citizens from the abusive power of the state. And according to John Rawls and Ronald Dworkin, the core feature of liberalism is equal liberty in which equality among citizens is the starting point of a liberal political theory. However, from my reading of Kim's paper, neither of these themes are prominent in Mariama's thought. He did mention the need to constrain the abusive and even totalitarian power of the wartime Japanese state and did think the state should respect the citizens' basic freedom. But in many other places, as Kim has nicely revealed in the third part of his paper, Mariyama's theory has conspicuous illiberal components, such as his idolization of Meiji nationalism, his idea that personal freedom should sometimes give way to the purpose of national integration, and in particular, his uh, thought that a dictator may be needed in order to forge responsible and autonomous citizens. I guess, but this is just my guess, I think um, he may also think that the state should promote people's sense of responsibility by using his coercive political power. So Kim thinks that Mariama is ambiguous on these points, such as how liberalism and nationalism sh could be possibly reconciled. But that actually makes me think that Mariama's identity as a liberal is also ambiguous. Compared with Mariama, pre-war liberals' liberal credential is even more doubtful. According to Kim's summary of Mariyama's characterization of pre-war Japanese liberals, these early liberals were obsessed by the expansion of personal freedom to the extent of promoting selfish egoism. And because of this obsession, they also failed to resist the state's encroachment of individual rights. If Mariyama's characterization is right, then we have good reasons not to call, to, to call these pre-war Japanese thinkers as liberals, because they did not have a robust defense of public good or public interests, which Western liberals from Locke to Ross never failed to provide. And because they did not have any concern with the danger of state power, which Shiklar regards as the central task of a liberal theory. To be clear, I'm not saying that we should define liberalism solely according to Western standards, but that raises a methodological question. How can we define liberalism in non-Western contexts? Should we merely defer to these thinkers' self-identifications or evaluate their, uh, their liberal credentials according to our own judgments? I think Kim could answer these questions, but that requires him to develop this paper even further either by incorporating more historical contextualization or by including more reconstructions of Mariyama's philosophy. I will now turn to my suggestions for Kim. So my general suggestion is that it would be better for Kim to highlight the aspects of Mariyama's thought that would make him an interesting figure for political theorists to, to care about and engage in. So in this paper, I take Kim wants to reconstruct Mariyama's theory of personal freedom in order to turn it into an attractive version of liberalism. To emphasize the distinctiveness of Mariyama's ideas, Kim compared his thought with canonical Western thinkers, uh, Western liberal thinkers, such as Hobbes, uh, Locke, Mill, and uh, Berlin. The hallmark of Mariyama's liberalism, according to Kim, is the idea that individual citizens should use their freedom in a socially responsible way. And this sense of responsibility constitutes the core of individual autonomy. Kim thinks that this aspect makes Mariyama different from the majority of, West, uh, of Western liberals. But I wonder if this is really the case. I think no liberals would disagree with Mariyama that people should use their personal freedom properly and that the well-functioning of a liberal democracy depends partly 
on how ordinary citizens behave in a responsible manner. So Rawls, for example, thought that an ideal citizen should simultaneously have two moral capacities. As a rational person, she can pursue her own conceptions of the good using whatever advantages at her hands. But as a, re but as a reasonable person, her pursuit of her rational goal is conditioned by her sense of justice and voluntary compliance with the fair terms of social cooperation. I think Maruyama would also find Kant's moral and political philosophy, which emphasizes autonomy and responsible self-legislation close to his conception of personal freedom. And speaking unabashedly for myself, I'm participating in Stanford's civics initiative and helping develop the core curriculum for civic education. And I think civic education is also an important theme that liberals have cared about for a long time. That's why I think merely characterizing Maruyama as a theorist of responsible liberty would not be sufficient in highlighting the most interesting aspect of Maruyama. So a more promising way I personally think is to focus on the particular challenge that Maruyama was facing in post-war Japan. And as Kim has just said in the presentation, historical or national context matters and matters a lot. So an interesting theme in Maruyama's thought, Kim mentions, is, there, is that there was a cultural break between pre-modern and modern Japan. Uh, when the traditional Confucian moral system collapsed, pre-war liberals failed to build a new public culture or to use Kim's words, an al uh, alternative normative values that can fill the moral vacuum. So Maruyama thinks that this moral vacuum should be responsible for Japan's wartime crime. On page 18, Kim says that what Maruyama thought problematic was that the traditional moral principles of loyalty and filial piety, which had constituted the core essence of moral life in traditional Japanese society, were simply ruled out and replaced by the imported notion of personal freedom without serious deliberation on the political and social implications of this ideational change. I think this could be a very interesting point worth developing. My question is, did Maruyama think that some Confucian values should be preserved and modernized in Japan? Did he have any thought on whether responsible liberty could be grafted onto Confucian values? Does he think that nationalism could replace Confucianism to serve as the basis for a new Japanese public culture? Actually, learning from my friend Sean uh, Aldair, I, I, I know that a lot of Japanese nationalist thinkers in the early 20th century actually used the Confucian morality of filial piety and loyalty to construct nationalist ideologies centered upon the devotion to the emperor. So what's Maruyama's attitude towards these ultra-nationalists? How did Maruyama repurpose and reconstruct um, Japanese nationalism in order to serve his liberal agenda? Is his effort successful? I think it would be interesting for Kim to answer these questions in his future project. Another suggestion is that I wonder if Kim could connect his project with the field of Cold War intellectual history. I'm saying this because I find that there are some fascinating philosophical reflections on Japan's wartime behavior and responsibility in Maruyama's thought, especially the comparison he makes between Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. So this reminds me of the post-war discussion on the origins of totalitarianism in Europe, which Hannah Arendt, Rima Ahung, uh, Karl Friedrich, uh, Judith Schlar, Karl Popper, and uh, Leo Strauss have famously participated in. We now have seen a lot of excellent intellectual histories on these thinkers and Cold War liberalism. But a few of them have delved deeply into post-war East Asian reflections on totalitarianism, fascism, nationalism, and the prospect of liberal democracy. I think a study of Maruyama could fill this gap, but that requires situating Maruyama into his historical context. For example, in addition to Maruyama's response to pre-war Japanese liberals, I wonder whether Maruyama also participated in the global exchange of ideas after the Second World War. To my knowledge, there's evidence showing that Maruyama had read Karl Schmitt, but did he also read Hannah Arendt and others? was his reactions to these European thinkers. How did he use these European theories to analyze Japanese history? Or how did he criticize or revise these theories 
in the light of Japan's particular historical trajectory. So I think I should stop here. I really enjoyed reading the paper and think that writing a history of post-war Japanese political thought can be an important contribution to the field of global intellectual history. I'm really looking forward to seeing the development of this project and hope my comments and suggestions could be helpful for Kim. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, thank Dong Xian for the comments. Now uh, we have Dr. Banai's comments on Kim. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good to see everyone. And um, uh, thank you to Aurelian and Kwang Yu for inviting me to comment on this um, uh, paper. And Kim, thank you for um, distributing your paper. Um, I must also thank for um, saying about 90% of what I was going to say on the substantive side of um, thing is actually great because I have a lot of structural suggestions and that might help you um, improve this paper, taking into account many of the substantive uh, point that uh, Dan Chen put on the um, uh, paper. Um, there to be three on in this paper. One, there's a very abstract, I would say, discussion about liberty uh, that with which the paper begins, a very decontextualized, abstract, uh, which sits very oddly, I'll get into it in just a uh, minute, on a paper that is supposed to be very historical and contextual. Uh, the second thing that's going on, the question of uh, Mariana's thought on liberty, which is um, a brief and episodic, um, and I'll discuss that in just a bit as well. And then the last thing that's going on is this kind of semi-independence slash national for the development of post-war Japan. Um, reading the paper just right off the bat, it seemed order needs to be reversed. Uh, uh, to the paper, there more historical contextualization and more, frankly, for a reader who's not acquainted with Mariyama or uh, history of pre-war or post-war um, Japan, um, that history needs to be stated that it gave me a lot more direct the end of the paper um, to figure out exactly how to locate his thoughts who he was speaking to and then correct many of the comments or thoughts that I had. So the first um, I have is that the paper should begin with a proper historicization of Mariyama. Who is he? Uh, why, why it is that we should care about his particular perspective on liberty and, um, and, and what his intellectual lineage looks like um, to anxieties to what concerns and preoccupations is he speaking to um, so that from then on then we could kind of think perhaps a little bit more abstractly about how his thoughts on liberty might relate or revise um, our uh, uh, more western notions of, of, of liberty that you visit. So the discussion about liberty I would say at the beginning it's it's a bit problematic because um, discussing Berlin, Mill, Locke, and Murayama in kind of a back and forth fashion, I think misses an important element here, which is that Murayama or Mariyama is, it, it, me it seems by the time I got to the end of your paper, is concerned exclusively with the exercise of responsible and liberty in post-war Japan. And he is giving an account of how it is that perhaps irresponsible or licentious understandings of liberty in pre-war um, uh, uh, Japan gave rise to that kind of uh, hyper-nationalist, militarist um, uh, posture. It might be coming back again in the, in the post-war period, right? So he is exclusively talking about a, a case um, and, a, and a singular country and a singular society in mind. The reason why I think it's difficult to kind of begin with an abstract discussion of liberty of um, a la Berlin or Hill in this regard is that um, they are avowed philosophical and normative and decontextualized um, in this regard. Um, uh, it's almost like talking about appendages here because Mariyama has a very specific um, set of antipathies and prescriptions in mind that are connected to the Japanese case. And, and, and then on the other hand, we have very abstract philosophical reflections on the two concepts of liberty, for instance, that uh, Berlin is talking about. No doubt there is a Cold War frame within which liberal uh, post-war liberalism is also thinking about those 
of um, a liberalism in the case of Berlin. I think um, uh, it's a bit of a kind of a bewildering experience to be going back and forth, seeing things seem to be out of context. Connects to the second point, which is discussion of Maruyama's thought, I think, on liberty, um, ironically, is a lot more decontextualized than what would love. Um, I never got a definition of exactly what Maruyama thinks about liberty, for instance. There's no direct quotation from any of his works. I think he would do well to really bring out his own writing a lot more, to insert him into the text. I get a lot of interpretations from you as to why what he says is neither negative or positive, but something uh, about the exercise of res responsible liberty on cognitive and volitional uh, exercise of individual uh, 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 um, But that seems to me to be missing a lot more that perhaps Maruyama has said elsewhere. It would be good to kind of pin down exactly a quotation that says Maruyama thinks that this is what liberty or um, uh, the core of liberty is about. Um, and this connects to um, this other point that I had it seems to me that a lot of the issues, I kept struggling in the paper, um, a lot of the differences that Maruyama seemed to have had with uh, the negative and positive distinction of liberty um, are not so much about the um, exercise or irresponsible exercise of liberty so much there are problems of constitutional design. Um, it, it, the, the core concern here may not be that people are, you know, need to become more responsible executors of their individual will to have an examined life and to be reflective, etc. That would be paternalistic. That would be that would be a recipe for a kind of a positive liberty. Why? Because then who gets how to think about one's agency, etc. His issue here is that. Rather, the checks and balances that one would find in a kind of a liberal legal regime, a constitutional um, a system, was never in place in Japan. So as you say at the, at the end of the paper, um, the emperor did play this outsized role as the arbiters, arbi ultimate, ultimate arbiter of disputes in that system. Well, that's not a system of liberal constitutional legality, right? Um, it doesn't allow for the responsible exercise of um, liberty because there is no laws by which the harm principle in the kind of a million sense is institutionalized into law, right? Um, and I think uh, you would do bring that up. What are issues of constitutional design here that Maruyama and, and the cohort of post-war liberal thinkers or reformist thinkers, right? No, they're not necessarily liberal. I think as Dong Jun, that, that term very uh, pregnant with a whole host of post-independence uh, or um, value judgments in it. But what do these cohort of reformists, let's say, think about the problems of constitutional design that don't allow for the exercise of individual liberty in this um, uh, instance? Lastly, on this point about the problem of post-independence independence and nationalism, I think there's a separate discussion going on that is kind of both feeding into Maruyama's um, motivation to rethink about the boundaries of responsible liberty or, or to show licentious interpretation of pre-will liberty to rise to a kind of a rapacious nationalism, right? But by itself, I think it sits uneasy, uneasily in the paper as a discussion that, um, uh, uh, that, that is on the one hand about the collectivity, not about this exercise of individual will that Mariama, Ma, Mariama is talking about. Um, but on the other hand, um, one in which Mariama seems to have his own prescriptions about a civic view of nationalism. What are those civic precepts? What does he think that, you know, a, a responsible interpretation of post-war nationalism should contrast with uh, 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 and how, how it should contrast with that kind of pre-war um, uh, and wartime uh, uh, concept of a nationalism that seems to have been so much more chauvinistic, um, uh, ethnic, and, and anti-liberal. So on the whole, I would say um, 
the, dis the discussion is ironically too abstract for something that is supposed to be deep historicized, deeply contextual. Uh, we need to hear more from Mariam, to hear about more about his life and times. Um, I struggle with this myself as I try to kind of bring a lot of liberal thinkers to life to really contextualize them in a way that um, did their thought for the period in which they're speaking about quite justice, but also not to put in a philosophical comparison on something that is only something very historical and contextual, right? We're not talking about normative political um, in the case of Mariyama's specific grievances with Japanese political order, right? He's, he has some empirics in mind. He's, he's speaking about particular people that he wants to um, uh, either uh, 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 kind of bring to the tribunal historical judgment or, uh, or, or to shape in a different way. You have to kind of make those uh, border areas, I think, clear. The thing I'll say is that the pandemic thing, it's great for a presentation, but in a paper, it just doesn't fit any of these frames. I would take it out both at the beginning and at the end. Um, it's nice something for us to think about and as we think about responsible citizenship. But it, and it's, I would say it's more about responsible citizenship than about the responsible exercise of liberty more than anything else. But I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for this paper. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will open the table. So uh, this is what we will do, like just type some words in, in the chat room so I can know you want to speak or raise your hand in the Zoom. I will keep a record of the queue and ask each of you. Uh, to speak and uh, if uh, any comments or questions to the I think three three uh, panelists would be good. Yeah. So or should I respond to the discussion? Yeah, you you can respond now or, or some at some moment later. Um, oh, yeah, okay. I think we have uh, Simon have a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm largely building on what um, Dongshen and Dr. Banai has said, and this is a question about the selection of uh, of thinkers. Because um, um, my question is why Berlin and probably even uh, why Hobbes and Locke. Um, and I'm recalling one of this uh, one or similar conversation I had with uh, Russ um, about this, and he I think he would say uh, liberalism has updated itself quite a lot uh, to involve this conversation about responsibility. Um, there are other contemporary liberal thinkers who had like largely talked about the idea of uh, responsibility and many of them on, on, on this uh, politics and community um, orientation, right? So we have uh, people like Iris Young, we have Michael Walzer, and more or less Hannah Rent, like also on this fashion, like in this fashion talking about um, liber um, um, this this idea of uh, ideas of uh, like responsible citizenship, or obligations or or loyalty in general. Um, on the other hand, we also have like more indivi sorry individualistic liberal thinkers who are trying to reclaim um, obligation from a um, from from the discussion of a. Uh, uh, like the, uh, sorry, from this like more or less communitarian uh, communitarian direction, um, and the person that comes to my mind would be um, who Dong Xian just mentioned, Judith Shaklar, and Bill just wrote a, a, an excellent book review about this, about Shaklar's attempt to reclaim obligation. So, um, would these people be be, um, be more relevant to your comparison? Because I mean, I do see a point of using Berlin or Hobbes and Locke because they are canonical thinkers. But on the other hand, part of the purpose of comparative political theory is indeed to challenge this canonical way of thinking about political theory. So this is just a question that I have, and like they might have like broader implications for for the for your methodology. Something Dong Shen has also mentioned in his comments. Okay. Thank uh, Simon. And if, if Kim or any other uh, of the panelists want to speak, you can speak now because I haven't seen any following uh, questions. Okay, yeah. Yeah, can I go? Yeah. yeah sorry, sorry my, I learned how to use my clap hand today, so I'm very eager to use that. 
So Min Yok, I, I thought these were fantastic, nice presentation, and these are fantastic comments. So I really would encourage you strongly to follow up on them. And um, it does echo a little bit the conversation a number of us had at the dissertation defense, right? Because if I recall correctly, a number of people were also encouraging you to sort of contextualize this. And I, I thought um, some of the reasons for that became even more clear today. I mean, what, one concern I have is there is a kind of historical anachronism here, right? You want, it sounds like you want to go back and retrieve this guy as a kind of moderate, conservative, liberal of sorts. And what I heard um, these two uh, experts telling you is that that just doesn't work so well. And that, and you know, based on the, I've read one of this, one published collection in English, and that sort of corroborates my sense as well. I mean, we've talked about this. I mean, I, I came to this author through New Left Review, you know, and um, the ways in which he was engaging with the left. So this is a really complicated story. So have, is there something about how you might want to contextualize this that you see as maybe a way moving forward? I mean, I'm just, I, I, you know, I know this is, all these things were thrown at you. Um, you know, Cold War liberalism might be a way of doing it. The problem I have with that is I think, again, I think he's messier. I'm not sure he's always a liberal. I'm sure, you know, he's engaging with people on the right and the left. He's someone who's, right? I mean, I think this is kind of, maybe this is just really dumb. I don't know enough about him. But he's someone after fascism, right? He's engaging with the legacy of fascism. I learned, I didn't know this. He was actually, a, he was a soldier in Hiroshima. This I found out at the end of the war, which is fascinating. Yeah, yes. You know, I mean, it's fascinating, right? And, you know, trying to somehow both be a critic of post-war Japanese democracy and defend it. I mean, there's a whole really interesting story there. So anyhow, I mean, maybe, is there, you know, is why not go in that direction? And is it because it's been done? Um, and if you were to go in that direction, how could you do that? I mean, I'm also a little worried, this idea of responsible liberty. I, I just, I mean, that's John Locke, you know, liberty is not license. Liberty is always liberty under law. Even Isaiah Berlin, I, I, I don't buy that contrast. You know, I mean, I think he also, he would say, yes, this is a kind of responsible liberty, at least in some ways. And there is a Kantian, I mean, there is a difference there because I think there's a Kantian background in, in, in the thing you're looking at, you know. Um, so, but anyhow, I mean, maybe you could just talk a little bit about if that's a way to go, or maybe that you don't want to go that way and why you reject that. Does that mean I threw a lot out there, so. You, you can, can respond or any other question is also welcome. Okay, I will respond to Dong Shang's question or uh, point first, and then Professor Banai, Simon, and Bie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, too many difficult, difficult questions, uh, but very useful. So this video is recorded, so I will watch it later and I will yeah, reflect on it more deeply after our event. Uh, thank you so much for your thoughtful comment, Dongsheng. And I think that um, when I was writing my paper, I'm more interested in how the notion of liberty was understood in pre-war period and post-war period, rather than uh, what's similar between uh, general liberal thinkers and Mariama. And actually, uh, as I studied the liberalism, traditional liberalism, the defining the core principles of liberalism is very difficult. The boundary of liberalism is very unclear and flexible. Yes, uh, I think that your suggestion of comparing roles and liberalism would be very useful, which I didn't do in my paper. And yeah, I will think about other suggestions as well. Um, does it answer to your question? Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Banais, uh, point was more about the structure of the paper. And uh, actually, I, I wrote uh, this draft two months ago, finished it two months ago. But after I accepted my presentation at Tokabe Lecture, I was really struggled to what should I present there? What, what would be interesting to my audience? So I really tried to broaden the audience and uh, 
I thought that just specific historical explanation of Maruyama wouldn't be very interesting to other people. So I tried to put the story of COVID-19 and, and other some common themes such as Isaiah Berlin. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was really curious whether this work to, whether this kind of uh, experiment works. And I'm really glad that uh, the actual response from uh, you. So yeah, I should think about uh, what should I cut out and what should I develop, further develop. And, and in response to Simon's point, yes, so yeah, comparing Mariama with some contemporary liberals like Mike Walser might be very interesting. And But um, the reason why I chose John Rapp, Thomas Hobbes, and Isa Berlin in my paper is that uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Rapp is the liberal thinkers that Mariama actually uh, engaged in. He, uh, Mariama used in his analysis of liberty in his writings. So yeah, I should, uh, I had to include the, the, the discussion of John Locke and Hobbes. And, and Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty, uh, comparing it with Mariama's uh, notion of liberty, I thought it was very uh, useful to do that because everyone knows of something about that. Uh, definitely, uh, Mariama was familiar with Hannah Arendt's uh, writings, although he didn't write much about it. So, yeah, comparing Mar uh, Mariama and Hannah Arendt might be somewhat interesting. And oh, I forgot what Bill <laughs> mentioned. If, if you want to contest, uh, many people in different ways. I thought, right? Tell me if I'm wrong. You, you need to contextualize this story more, right? Tell us a story about him in the context of post-war. I think Huss said this very nicely, right? Post-war yeah. Japan, what is his role in, in terms of his, what is his political theory doing? So if you were to move in that direction, now maybe you don't want to move in that direction. So how might you, maybe you just don't want to do that, but I'd be curious, why not? I don't think the criticisms from people were so much you need to compare him with this thinker or that thinker, but it was more this general kind of contextualist critique. So maybe you don't want to go there. Maybe you want to say, no, I want to see him as a, you know, an abstract theorist of responsible liberty. If so, I mean, I would be curious why you think that's the way to go. Um, if you don't want to go that way, if you do want to contextualize him, but you think they're already doing that, maybe just explain that a little bit. That's all. Uh, okay, I'm more interested in how Maruyama's contribution to the theorization of liberty in post-war period had shaped or uh, have shaped uh, contemporary understanding of liberty in East Asian region, which is different from Western understanding of liberty. So yeah, I should do some contextualization of his uh, thought by providing more historical context information. Actually, could I just, could I uh, jump in with a comment there? Uh, just yeah, yeah, why please, I, yeah um, uh, just following on from the other comments about contextualization, I, I think that the uh, Mariyama's uh, post-war essay, The Theory and Psychology of Ultranationalism, would be a really good place to work from in, in contextualizing uh, Mariyama's thought in the, in relation to the I guess the very undeveloped notion of, of what he called interior or private morality in the development of the early uh, modern Japanese, Japanese state. So he uh, begins the essay with uh, discussing Carl Schmitt's notion of the neutral state, just saying that, that this notion never took off in Japan because there was no sort of reformation like there was in Europe where the church and the state sort of worked out each other's relations with each other and which the notion of conscience and of, 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 of interior morality developed. Whereas in Japan's case, and this was really catalyzed in the, uh, in the early uh, sort of um, process of the formation of the nation state, the emperor came to be seen as the ultimate source and font of morality. 
uh, and there was no sense in which individuals could be seen to be uh, um, their own agents of, of a kind of a, a notion of personal responsibility for morality in contrast to the state. Um, so yeah, I think that would be a really good place to contextualize uh, Mario Amas' thought, and particularly in relation to the notion of, of uh, yeah, liberalism's emphasis on the lim limitation of state power, which just was not conceived of by, particularly by the more conservative, uh, or, or we might say ultra-nationalist, particularly uh, thinkers in the early 20th century in Japan. So yeah, I, I think that, that would be a really great essay to uh, answer, address some of the questions which have been raised in this session. Yes, and in my pre presentation, I couldn't address some dark side of Maruyama, but in my paper, I, I wrote extensively on this topic. And that's, uh, in some sense, in my presentation, I only talk about some bright side of Maruyama, why he's a relevant thinker in today's situation. But yeah, he's very complicated, liberal, and they ma that makes me very interesting to study his idea of liberty because he lived in very complicated time. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think I like also have a question related to Simon and uh, Professor Shulman. Like, I think it's okay, still okay to like do a like in depth theoretical uh, exploration of. Mariama's theory of liberty, especially by like exploring his engagement with like the liberal thinkers in the West. I find like one part very interesting that is like that is the Mariama's engagement with with uh, John Law. Um, like it seems according to your interpretation, like I think this on page eleven, page twelve, in, in terms, uh, it, it looks like that Mariama actually much appreciated. Uh, Locke's theory of liberty, like he, he did actually a very, seems to have, I haven't read him, but according to your paper, he did a very comprehensive reading of Locke, including um, he, uh, Locke's philosophical writing, not only his political writing. Mm -hmm. So my, but my puzzle comes like when, when you says on page 12 that, quote, uh, Mariama's interpretation that Locke's notion of liberty demands cautious and prudent thinking as a precondition for it, for it appears not so much Locke's original voice as the message Mariama wanted to underscore to his post-war post -war audience. I have this puzzle, I have a question about this interpretation because I think Mariama actually pretty much accurately got the gist of Locke's theory of liberty. As Professor Schumann said, I actually know, know both uh, Western like those canonic, canonical Western liberal thinkers would think that liberty means like license. I think liberty, Locke's liberty is everything about responsible liberty, if that's, that's a correct uh, characterization. So maybe we can look at the, like the second treatise. I think you, you mentioned like uh, Mariama uh, uh, discussion of like Locke's uh, understanding of for human, human nature, something like that. But you didn't discuss much about even Locke's second treatise. Uh, this famous section six in which of second treatise in which Locke talk, talks about the natural law. He, he says clearly that like um, liberty is not about license. Liberty is about like uh, acting within the bound of natural law, especially that you don't even have the liberty to destroy yourself. This means that you don't have liberty to like post deadly risk to your own life and to others' life. You, you don't have the liberty to not wear a mask in public, right? So, and also in section, section like uh, 22 and the other section, you can also see Locke's definition of liberty. And that's very, I think, very consistent with, with uh, Mariama's own theorization of liberty. So my point is that I think Mariama actually learns a lot from the Western classical liberal tradition. And uh, like, if I would, and as, as uh, 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 I think who, I forgot who's talking about, you, you, you definitely need to like uh, provide more in depth, like textual analysis of Mariama, right? Yeah, and how he engaged different 
political thinkers' writings, you, you should provide more textual evidence of, for your argument. And that would make your paper more like fully developed and more interesting. So, so this is more of a comment, but if it, it is about a question, I would ask like, like which uh, authors in the Western liberal tradition influenced Mariama most? Like how and why? And I think you can start from, from you know, you don't only you don't have to focus on this question, but you can start from like give a giving a, a general answer to this question, and uh, this will also I think contextualize Mariama's thought in the tradition of liberalism. Yeah, I found that Mariama's interpretation of John Locke was very interesting because it, his interpretation of John Locke is, was very selective and in, in some place some arbitrary interpretation of John Locke. But the reason why uh, Mariama chose John Locke as the most extreme, uh, excellent uh, Western liberal, the, why he chose Locke is very interesting to me. Uh, uh, I wrote in my paper, but um, Mariama was also interested in the theory of toleration written by Junra. Uh, Mariama thought that that kind of toleration should be uh, imported in the culture of Japan. So yeah, that part should be developed, I think. Can I just emphasize something here since we're on this? Um, uh, I think uh, one of the points that we're coming back to over and over again is that I think there is no clear exegesis of Yama's definition of liberty anywhere in the paper. Um, uh, I, we're getting your interpretation of it. And there is a lot of compared to the, the Mariama says this about Locke or, or says this about Hobbes, but there is no, but what does Mariama, what is that statement of liberty is law, right? Or, and it's fine to interpret and intuit, um, but where are those relevant passages, right? And I think in the paper, you kind of put these out there um, uh, but without really extrapolating. So on page 19, you say to, to recapitulate, uh, in his analysis of failure of pre-war liberalism, Mariam identified a couple of theoretical weaknesses of pre-war liberalism. First, he pointed out that the early liberals did not seriously think about a potential conflict between the demands of both individual liberty and national independence, but then there's no quotation following. And the second point is another one sense kind of, you know, uh, point right there. I won't belabor it, but no, oh, I mean, I, I would like to see actually what he said, because there are two big concepts over there, right? Um, uh, that need to be really uh, elaborated on uh, for us to understand exactly by individual liberal context, right? Um, so I think you're doing a lot of kind of recounting, uh, but not a lot of kind of like evidence is, evidence is demonstrated, so just textual evidence, not even contextual, of what is actually kind of saying about these uh, theoretical points. Yeah, I think Next, we have Professor Isaac. Hi, hi. Um, this is a, a great discussion. I don't think I have anything substantive to add to it. I simply, uh, maybe for you, Kim, but maybe even for all of us in our discussion. So on page uh, two of the paper, the very top, of the page, it says, note, this essay is written as a second chapter of my dissertation. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, it makes a difference as we critically engage this text. And as you think about revising it, whether or not we think of it as a freestanding piece or as a chapter of a dissertation, in which case the real crucial questions have to do well, one set of crucial questions have to do with how you treat the subject of this chapter, but the other one is how this chapter relates to the other chapters. So uh, now you, you chose to say that this was written as a chapter, but it's really not written so much like a chapter, as Hus points out, you know, the, the kind of uh, very contemporary uh, introduction and conclusion, and I think certain other things about it. 
So the question really is twofold. I just want to make a, I want to, I want us to clearly distinguish between two questions. One is how you might better think about treating the topic of Mariama in chapter two of your dissertation. And then the second question is, if this is going to be a freestanding paper, what do you do with it? Um, you know, uh, and those are just different questions that you need to think about, only you can answer. That's it. Yes, uh, so I think that I can still use this manuscript for my second chapter of dissertation if I rewrite the introduction and conclusion part of this paper, because in the main body of this uh, manuscript, I, I think, yeah, after some revision and development, uh, it's primarily the, uh, focusing on the Mariama's understanding and notion, conceptualization of liberty. So, yeah, so in the second chapter of it, yes. If the, uh, one question, I think, I think the question that both commentators are raising is whether you're, you're developing that idea in a sufficiently systematic way, drawing on Mariama's texts. That's a very important question, especially if this is the only chapter that's treating Mariama. But the other set of questions that are being raised by Bill and maybe some others, and Bill's on the committee, so he's kind of approaching it from that vantage point as well, has to do with like which other liberals you put into conversation with Mariama. And partly that depends on which other liberals you put into conversation with the other subjects of your other chapters. And I don't think that's a question that could be answered just for Mariama. That is a strategic question about the dissertation as a whole. But with regard to Mariama, you're being given some really important, very focused suggestions about how you can, you can improve your, your account of him. It may be you need to say a lot more about him in this chapter and a lot less about Isaiah Berlin or Locke or anyone else. But again, that's a question that has to do with this as a dissertation chapter, which is a different thing than as a freestanding paper. Next, we have Dongxian. Yeah, so I think I just have a very quick question is kind of elided by, uh, elided by uh, Jeff's uh, question about kind of the relationship between your different chapters. So, uh, because I think we didn't talk too much about that last time in, in, in Bloomington. So, do you have any idea about kind of the structure of your dissertation and uh, kind of the place of this chapter in the overall dissertation plan? And uh, kind of, I, I have the sense that kind of you don't want to just focus on Mariama, but kind of Mariama's connection with different thinkers in Japan or maybe East Asia in general. So can you talk more about that? Oh, yes. So, so Mariama is the central thinker of my whole dissertation, but in other chapters, I will engage with other important post-war post Japanese thinkers, such as Otsuka Hisao and Kawashima Takeyoshi. Uh, those, those thinkers are very close to, very uh, closely interacted with Mariama and Otsuka developed a very uh, good theory on thought on modernization and Kawashima uh, developed his idea on the legal basis of the society or rule of law. And the last chapter of my dissertation, I will, I'm thinking of about comparing Mariama with uh, John Dewey, the American liberal thinker. Uh, next, we have Miguelin. Uh, I'm not sure that's the full name. Um, hi, I'm uh, Mark Yellen. I'm with Liberty Fund, um, known to some of you, especially Aurelian. Uh, I, I work for an organization that really likes the phrase responsible liberty, but I'm not going to dwell on that. So I, I appreciate that, uh, that term in the paper. I actually was really struck wanting to know what is Mariama's theory of nationalism? Um, and because we, because I hear uh, uh, comments on ultra nationalism, pathological forms of nationalism, is there a healthy form of nationalism in his view? And is liberalism somehow connected to it? Like if this is meant to be a tamed nationalism, and also in terms of theories of nationalism, does he tend more towards like a kind of uh, primordialist full of nationalism. There's always been the nation from time immemorial, or is he more of a Gil uh, uh, Ernest Gellner approach, which is like elites structure nationalism, you know, like going back to the Meiji Restoration. So would they be um, 
key to his understanding of the nation. And I'll stop with that. Oh yes, he's, he has very sophisticated idea on the relationship between liberalism and nationalism. Actually, during the post-war period, he uh, argued for healthy nationalism. The reason why he emphasized the nationalism was that, uh, first of all, uh, he thought that without national independence, individual liberty cannot be protected. Under colonial government, there will be less and less room for liberalism, liber individual liberty. And, and more importantly, he thought that um, particip participation in the politics and uh, people's voluntary uh, effort to construct good nation will be a good practice for individuals to uh, practice their this, this liberty responsibly. So if there is some healthy balance between liberalism and nationalism, I think that uh, Mariama believed uh, it could create some synergy, some construct constructive relationship Okay, who wants to uh, speak? I have a question. Okay, yeah. I'm wondering what uh, the dissertation advisor of this really interesting dissertation has to say. <laughs> so you are asking uh, the dissertation advisor to, to respond? <laughs> so I'm interested uh, in um, supervising a dissertation that um, uh, makes a contribution to comparative political thoughts. So uh, in the conversations that, that we've had, and um, um, I've read two chapters thus far, I think um, my main um, um, interest is in uh, what what does this chapter in intellectual history can teach us about comparative political theory? And uh, that's why I, I suggested that Hussein Haas can join us for that and Don Xiang as well. So I think that uh, uh, whatever has been said thus far is, is, uh, is very good to help uh, Kim um, get the, the ground more solid. And uh, whether or not he chooses uh, the, the specter of Cold War liberalism uh, remains to be seen. The, that framework is uh, something up up in the air in the in the dissertation uh, thus far, but I do think that he's uh, he's on solid ground when he says that that um, it's important that that we uh, we discuss him in connection with the authors that he uses. So if he hasn't used Judith Schlar, uh, I don't think uh, it makes a lot of sense to uh, uh, hold him uh, against that background. The interesting uh, thing is why he chooses some authors and not others. So, for example, Tocqueville is not very much of a presence for Maruyama at times, and uh, it's interesting to speculate why. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that uh, the con con contribution, and I think the dissertation ought to contribute to this emerging field of comparative political theory. And in this regard, I think that it's, it's not enough to, to say culture matters, but I do think that it's very important to, to show how it enriches our understanding of, um, of let's say, liberalism, uh, and for that matter, liberal democracy, which is a concept that probably is more, more relevant uh, for us today than just liberalism. So that's what I would have to say. Good. Uh... I do have one, one, one comment, and this, this, this is based on, on Hasse's uh, suggestion earlier. I think it's important for, for the dissertation to also highlight the institutional framework uh, that uh, Mariama had in mind. The institutional framework does matter and nationalism, you know, the support for the emperor, uh, you know, some, some vision of parliamentary life, party politics. I think all, all of this has to be clarified to some extent. Um, I'd like to see it a little bit more concrete in that regard. I agree, uh, this is a, this is a ne necessary addition. Yeah, I have something to say about the last point. So what's very interesting and also very puzzling about Mariama's 
uh, host who are thinking is that he didn't say much about institutional or constitutional aspect of liberty because that's, I think, somewhat related to the, the, the occupation or US occupation after the post war, during the post war period, because the construction of post war liberal democracy in Japan was largely monitored and managed by the occupation authority led by General MacArthur. MacArthur. So the institutional background of liberal democracy was given, imposed by external power. So what Maruyama more deeply concerned about was whether Japanese people could sustain those institu mm -hmm. institution after the United States left Japan and they, they alone, Japanese people maintain their democracy on their own hand. That's why Maruyama focused on cultural and psychological aspects of liberty. Good. Uh, it's actually have been like 75 minutes. So let's see who else wants to speak. I think this is very good. Already you want to like offer some excellent concluding final remarks as you did. <laughs> I'm well, not able to do that. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think that for all of us, at least, at least for, for, um, for me, but I think for all of us, it's very interesting to, to figure out whether the concept of Confucian, whatever, uh, liberal democracy is an oxymoron or, or not. And I think that there are differences here. It's too big an umbrella. And Dong Xiang, I think, encouraged uh, Kim to, to, to think more about this issue. Um, this is a debate that will, will stay with us for, for some years to come, maybe decades. Um, and um, there's some literature there. And I think that, that Kim's dissertation could, could bring a contribution. So you have to do a very good presentation of Mariama and a few others. But I think at the end of the day, we care less about, about one author or another than about what they can teach us about that, that theme. So I, I wonder whether anyone has anything to say about this. I'm personally interested in that. I, I, don't think, I don't think liberal democracy comes only in westernized flavors. I think, I think that would be a signification. There should be some, some other forms and there are. And uh, the question is, how, how are they different from what we know? Uh, culture, of course, is, is going to make a big difference. Religion is gonna, gonna intervene, but history is gonna be part of the story as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm f like, I think in my understanding, like Mariama's like intellectual legacy is actually successful, right? Uh, because Japan, Japan has successfully, uh, successfully uh, kept maintain its liberal democracy. I think this is an important lesson we can learn from the Japanese case. That's why we want to study this case and uh, the post-war mm -hmm. Japanese liberal. I think that's that makes the topic interesting. Can I um, just follow Aurelian's excellent comment here? It's one of the things um, I think writing about liberal actually, but about any ideology in a kind of a non-Western context is to um, uh, the, the urge is, especially if one engages in comparison to bring some sort of resolution or certain to otherwise very uncertain and open-ended uh, preoccupations at the time. I think in the case of liberalism, especially you know, a lot of these commitments are being debated as they're being reflected on. And it's okay to reflect that irresolution, the, the contradictions, the tensions, because that conversation is ongoing. It's one of the things about that allows for the liberal project to kind of unroll in the second half of the 20th century. And to now too, I mean, Aurelian's excellent piece today, right? It's, it's a kind of a, this kind of constant contextualization of us universal abstract principles, right? Um, uh, the, uh, and I think it, when you're going kind of historicizing, it's important to capture, not to bring coherence to, but to capture those tensions and just state them as tensions, 
right? Um, because I think that actually brings out more of the historical weight on a post-war liberal thinker who is burdened with that kind of history, right? They have to reconciling something. They're not going to you know, go out there. That's why I said that comparison with Berlin might not stick as much because there's a confidence, there's a bravado, there's a philosophical kind of enunciation of a new kind of liberalism that Berlin um, is, is kind of giving us and is not as burdened as especially semi-colonial or post-colonial thinkers are. Yeah, I, I want to underscore this point. Uh, I like Berlin, but Berlin's liberalism is liberalism with a glass of sherry or a glass of port. It's very comfy. It's like pudding and port in, in a college high table in Oxford. Uh, these guys there were, were, were dealing with occupation, with the legacy of fascism, uh, with, with an emperor who was, you know, uh, uh, you know, was a symbol, but a charged symbol. Uh, all of this stuff uh, was there, and he was trying to make ends meet, and he wasn't uh, as comfy as Berlin. So in, for me, you know, because of my background as East European, I think these thinkers are actually more interesting than the ones that, that, that deal with a, with a kind of a linear history, because here there's a kind of a, a rupture at some point, and, and you have to, to build from the rubble. And, um, uh, and I think that these tensions are very important and we shouldn't, uh, yeah, we shouldn't ignore them. We should make them actually even more clear and celebrate the success that Japan had in, in you know, coming back from uh, basically from the abyss. But, um, uh, you know, they, they were at uh, point zero in 1946 and, uh, and they, you know, they, they struggled. So, so were other countries. I think th this is something that that could could be could loom large on the, on on the dissertation agenda, uh, and and dealing with nationalism here is is fundamental. And, uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. The next. Yeah, thank you. And just a reminder, the next uh, event will be on, on October 9th and Michael Weinman, uh, our new uh, uh, colleague here at IU, will talk about his book, The Emergence of E-Liberalism. We'll, we'll send this announcement in due course. We hope to see uh, all of you then uh, and new faces as well. Enjoy the weather. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Don Xian. Thank you, Arlene. Well, thank you. Well done, Kwang Yu. Thank you. Good job, Kim. Thank you, Erica.